Hello, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. I'm Shweta Vandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, in today's webinar, we're going to discuss how environmental is social value. We have Adam Reed, Director of External Affairs of Suez Recycling and Recovery, who is moderating this webinar. Please go to the video panel section to find uh, other uh, webinars by Adam. And uh, in fact, we have another moderator on uh, today's panel. We actually have Sarah Oraway, who's going to be a panelist. And she is also a Be Waste Wise moderator. You'll find her panels also on the video panel section. She's a sustainability and social value lead at Suez Recycling and Recovery. We have Charlotte Osterman, who's a private sector lead at Social Value UK. Graham Dukesbury, chief executive at Groundwork UK. And Zoe Linkovich, I hope I'm saying your name right, senior technical advisor and head of communications at Waste Aid UK. Uh, we've received your questions, pass it on to the panelists. We would not have any polls today because we have a really full panel. So please use the Q&A section, use the chat box, put in your comments, your questions. Uh, I'm sure the panelists are ready to answer them. Over to you, Adam. Thanks very much, Shweta. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, or good anything, wherever you are in the world. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, as Shweta said, I'm Dr. Adam Reid, External Affairs Director at Suez, uh, and the current president of the Chartered Institution of Waste Management here in the UK. Um, very passionate about webinars, very passionate about testing the panel. Um, so I want really good questions from you, the audience. Thank you for joining us today. Um, you get as much out of this session as you put in. So good questions. We'll, we'll get good answers. If they don't get good answers, I'll tell the panel off and ask them to try harder with their next answer. Now, uh, social value is something that's very close to my heart, but more importantly, it's very close to one of my members of staff's heart, Sarah, and you're going to hear from her a bit later. But uh, here in the UK, we're really pushing forward on how do we ensure that the uh, environmental agenda isn't only environmental? There must be social benefits to what we're doing. How do we, um, how do we share that? How do we, uh, uh, what metrics do we use? What language do we use? How do we maximize that benefit? That's what today is about. But we're also gonna hear about projects overseas and globally because this isn't a UK centric issue. So huge, huge panel, huge amount of experience, looking forward to sharing their experience and making sure they stick to time. So that's my job for today. Um, get your questions in, we'll get them answered. And if we don't, we promise we'll answer them offline afterwards. So uh, let's get the first uh, speaker up, please. Sweater, we've got some slides, I think. We've got Charlotte Osterman from uh, Social Valley UK. Good morning, Charlotte, or good afternoon, Charlotte. How are you? I am good, thank you. So pleasure to be here. And thank you for hosting this session with a really good uh, question. How environmental is social value? So I'll be representing Social Value UK, uh, which is the professional network for social value here in the UK. We're also part of the wider Social Value International, uh, which is the global movement and standard setting for social value and impact. And as I'm starting off, I'm going to give you a little bit of a crash course on social value and how we see social value from, from our movements. So let's start. First of all, it's about value and it's about how we make decisions. So for too long, how we measure and how we value performance has been very skewed towards financial performance. We want to change that. We want to make sure that we're including the things that are important and that includes social and environmental benefits and consequences as well. So we think that if we change the way the world accounts for value, that's our mission statement. And if we do that, we will reduce inequality, environmental degradation and improve well-being. So how do we do it? We work with the principles. I'm going to give you uh, a quick minute on that later. But we really work with a set of principles uh, to understand the how. And then we work with people and our members to understand the changes that we're creating for, for the world. And then if we give away that power, that, that information, those, that information that we need for the decisions, we're in a better place to, to change the way we make decisions. So social value in its essence, the official definition would be that it's the quantification of the relative importance that people, people place on the changes that they experience in their lives. But that is a mouthful. So if we think about it, everything we do create and, create and destroy value. All of our actions do. They can be positive, they can be negative, uh, but everything we do create changes. Those changes are changes in people that people will experience as changes in, in their well-being. And that is what we call outcomes. So activities create different outcomes. We get that. Some outcomes are going to be more important than others. So we can rank them. And social value is really about understanding that relative importance and difference between those outcomes. 
SRI is a different thing, or well, it's similar, but it's basically just putting a financial so social return investment, putting a financial number on that. But you don't need to do SRI to understand what social value is. So as I said, there's a set of principles. So we need to recognize value is subjective. What is important and what I value is not going to be the same as that person over there or that one over there. Uh, we will we'll experience different, different things, different outcomes, and we'll value them differently. So our principles really start with involving stakeholders, because through their eyes, I will understand what effects our activities are having. And that will include those positive, those negative, those intended and those unintended. And then it's about verifying the results and work with these principles to ultimately be responsive, use this information to make better decision. So if we then go to, to the question of uh, what we're talking about today. So is social value environmental and is there an overlap? For me, it's just a super clear yes. Uh, you saw it in the mission, but we need to recognize, secondly, is to recognize that these agendas are so interlinked and principles, the principles of social value, they don't tell you what you should be measuring. They don't tell you measure X, Y, Z, and that is what is social value. They tell you about how you go about understanding the changes that you're creating for the stakeholders or with the stakeholders. So in that line of thinking, there's nothing excluding environmental outcomes in that. It, it's all part of the same picture. So if we can improve how we account for impact and value from that stakeholder uh, perspective, we will include those environmental outcomes as well. And I will leave it there because I was told not to overrun. Uh, but really, thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing what the rest of the panelists got to say on this topic as well. Thank you, Charlotte, for, for getting underneath the skin of this complex issue of what is social value. And I love that accounting for impacts and value. I think that really sets the scene nicely because there are so many moving pieces, aren't there? Whether we're putting a strategy in place, funding a local project, uh, running a behavior change campaign, you know, understanding impact and value and getting that in a way that you can then compare it with monetary or compare it with, with you know with other value sets I think is really important so thank you for setting the floor and we'll make sure I come back to you with some questions from the audience in a moment so next up moving along the uh, along the value chain we've got Graham Duxbury Graham representing Groundwork here in the UK how are you Graham? I'm very well thank you nice to um, see you and you and you pleasure to be here so I, th I think my job here is to bring some of that theory to life isn't it uh, by by showing some examples of, of how you might deliver activity in local communities that connect social and environmental value absolutely at the same time. So, uh, and I'll be, uh, I'm glad I'm following on from Charlotte because I agree with that, yes, 100%. It's absolutely uh, possible to connect these two things together. In fact, I'd argue absolutely essential. So if we can move on the slides, please, to the next one. Um, this is uh, who we are, um, and this is what we are. And so we're a charity operating across the UK, uh, focused on that twin mission of delivering social and environmental uh, value at the same time. Uh, we operate right across the UK. We've got a sister network in the US, and we have a long history of working with business partners to deliver corporate social responsibility programs, or as a, as a social value partner of those businesses as they deliver their kind of core business services. Next slide, please. Uh, and the origins, actually, of our organisation go back to the 1970s. Uh, I always find a little history lesson always, always useful and informative uh, because uh, round about that point, you had the first stirrings of consciousness about global warming. Uh, in the UK, you also saw lots of communities undergoing a very painful economic restructuring, uh, which left a, an impact on the physical environment. Uh, and on the fabric uh, of those communities. And, and Groundwork was established at around about that point as an experiment to test ways of working with communities to address the social and environmental issues that they were facing, one neighbourhood at a time, if you like. Next slide, please. Uh, this is how we talk about our mission now. Uh, so you can see that kind of thread uh, of connecting together the social and the environmental. So it's about improving the, the physical fabric uh, uh, of where, where people live. It's improving the prospects uh, of those people. And it's, it's connecting through as a golden thread, environmental responsibility and environmental behaviors. The next slide um, gives us another way of picturing that. So just another way of visualizing where we sit and how that work happens. So 
all of these uh, issues around the edge of that slide are the ones that we're trying to have an impact on. And, and our model is to use place-based community-led action as the driver for connecting up as many of those different outcome areas as possible. So what's it look like on the ground? Let's go to the next slide and have a picture. Um, so a few examples uh, from here on in. Um, so, so we're one of a number of uh, charities running recycling shops at waste facilities uh, in the UK. Very straightforward way of connecting social and environmental value. Those recycling shops, uh, more often than not, staffed by volunteers or people looking for work. Uh, this one is one in South Tyneside, where with a bit of lottery funding, we're managing to extend out from that kind of recycling facility out into the wider community with a bulky waste collection service kind of built on top of that existing uh, facility. If you go to the next slide, you'll see um, one of our two workshops in London, which uh, go by the name of The Loops. Uh, these are workshops based in the middle of housing estates, fairly disadvantaged housing estates, and they're used as places where the community can come to uh, uh, gain skills in the refurbishment of furniture and household goods, and then those goods are sold to people on the estate at affordable prices, people who may be struggling to, to furnish their homes. So it's impacting on the waste stream, it's impacting on social prospects, and it's building skills for employability at the same time. Go to the next slide, please. Um, and I'll just mention that training and education really are at the core of a lot of the work that we do in this space, hugely important, whether that's uh, looking at uh, food waste as a, the project on, on the left hand side, which is becoming a much more important topic to many of the people that we're dealing with, not just for environmental reasons and waste related reasons, but also as a way of starting that conversation about food poverty. Where do people get their food from? Uh, how can they make their money go further? Um, and, and in many areas, that kind of waste related education, that waste related training is, is being used as a stepping stone into employment um, in other sectors because you gain hugely valuable transferable skills engaging in, in environmental projects uh, with our charity that are connected to waste, but you can go on to find work in the grounds maintenance industry or the construction industry or the utilities industry uh, so that kind of stepping stone approach is one that's really important to us um, and my last my last slide if we move on to that one is is that ultimately all of this activity for us is about creating a, a sense of pride in, in in where you live both in terms of your kind of local neighborhood but also your responsibility to the wider environment and it's about kickstarting conversations quite often so whether as on the left hand side it's conversations among refugees and asylum seekers who are sharing their first hand knowledge of the impacts of climate change on their communities uh, that, that, that they've originated in uh, and using that as a way of stimulating conversation with the community that they found themselves in whether willingly or not uh, or on the right hand side an example of young people organizing a food festival in a garden built entirely from recycled materials all of these things are kind of just conversation starters um, so whether we're talking social value or esg goals or or, or whatever the terminology of, of the day is uh, uh, my, my main contention is that you have to join these two things up and there's never been a more important time to join these two things up uh, here in the uk uh, so the policy context is really pushing us in that direction we've got a net zero strategy we've just had the government launch a strategy called leveling up which is about addressing disadvantage between regions of the UK and within communities. And, and, and we're absolutely focused on health inequalities. The pandemic has shown us just how unequal health prospects are in the UK. So lots of reasons, lots of rationale for connecting these two things together. And the circular economy has got to play a full part in delivering those outcomes. I'll stop there. Thank, thank you, Graham. Some really good examples there. Um, uh, and, and I love your passion. It's, uh, it's always there whenever we do one of these webinars. A uh, quick question for Charlotte. Have we got the language right? Um, do we have common metrics, common language that means social value can be put into a building space or a, an environment space or, a, you know, or any space? Or, or are we all creating our own languages and therefore comparing apples and bananas is, is still quite, quite difficult? Do you mean around the metrics themselves or in terms of how we speak about social value and uh, the outcomes they're creating? A bit of both. I, I think I'm interested in, in the narrative that we use and whether we're, we're talking the same language, but I'm also interested in the metrics. Are there consistent metrics now for valuing impacts? For example, some of the examples that, that Graham shared there. I mean, can we compare them, you know, in Graham's examples to ones that you've worked on or to ones yeah. that, you know, Zoe might share in a moment, for example? So in terms of what Graham just presented, that's what I would find within our membership as well. And that is the kind of language that would be used uh, throughout the membership as well. 
Uh, in terms of metrics, there's no one standard set of metrics for social value. I guess there isn't really for environmental management either. That is universally accepted. Uh, what we are seeing though that is very uh, encouraging is that there was a report from OECD that came out summer last year. It's focusing on social impacts, but it's relevant for sustainable development in general. But it's going through different reporting approaches and they were really seeing a convergence in how we go about measuring social impact across the globe. Uh, and one of them is actually less focusing on those metrics and more focusing on the process that you go through to understand what you need to measure. So we're seeing convergence in that. And you can see that through some of the bigger initiatives as well around the Capitals Coalition, uh, Social International and then OECD, for example. Thank you. And Graham, um, some brilliant examples as always. Um, always uh, astounded by what you can achieve by starting with the community and, and working with them. But I mean, from that narrative, from that, you know, that, that, that social impact, I mean, how do, you, how do you provide evidence that says, yes, we've, we've helped with the resource agenda, you know, ten, tons reused or tons, you know, redistributed. How are you sharing the uh, the social narrative as well? Are you valorizing that, or are you just you know talking about it? Um, both, both. So in, any charity uh, in, involved in this kind of activity has to find a set of metrics that work. F finding finding metrics uh, and capturing robust data across a plethora of quite diverse local uh, projects all around the country is our biggest challenge. Um, so that impact story is, is one of the big things that, that we're focused on. Uh, and, and there's, you know, the, the, there's lots of recognised ways in which you can do that through, you know, survey activity to understand the changes to the way people think, feel and act, as well as the kind of hard output measures in terms of, you know, new facilities created and, you know, environmental enhancements undertaken and so on. The, the, the trick for me is, is to join up at both levels. So somehow you've got to create a framework that brings those, those measures together so that you can tell a kind of rounded story of scale. That impact uh, and, and make sure that that's as consistent as you can make it in a very dispersed network. Uh, but the other thing to do is to join them up uh, locally, join them up in a kind of place-based way sure. uh, and be able to tell the story. So, so quite a lot of our activities get focused in on particular places. So, so where the magic really happens is when you can get all this stuff going on in the same place. Yep. Um, and, and that's maximum value for money at the same time. So through the same investment, can you get this kind of really effective outcomes? And if you've got a community hub that you can use as a focus for a range of these activities, then effectively you just need to tell the story of that hub and the people that utilize it. So I'm a big believer in saying, yeah, metrics are great and you've got to have those, but you've also got to have the story and you've got to have someone telling that story in an authentic voice and someone demonstrating very, very clearly how this intervention has led to a difference in the way that they think, feel, or act. And taking those two things together, that's, that, that's the power of it. Thanks. Thank you. And I'm sure, Zari, in a moment, we'll talk about authoritative voices and local voices and, you know, people from within the, within the, the place, I think being place being so important. But just before we do, audience always are so sharp, straight onto it. You're talking about two legs of the triple bottom line or you know two two of the pillars of uh, of uh, sustainability but where's the economics and you just mentioned it briefly there Graham you talked a little bit about you know getting value for money I'm just wondering you know do, do these projects stack up financially uh, uh, in the round yes they have to because if they don't your charity goes out of out of business so that's that's absolutely got to be done I, I, I think there's two ways in which that economic bit comes in one is a lot of the outcomes that you're capturing will be about adding value to local economies one way or another whether that's through you know bringing people into the labor market that are out of the labor market making sure children are, are are engaged still in education as opposed to dropping out of education making sure that people are not uh, kind of drifting into a life of antisocial behavior and crime with all the economic knock-on costs that has got so you so you can capture all of that contribution to the local economy but you absolutely need to understand okay well this is how you get as many of those outcomes as possible being delivered for um the resource base that we've got um and and our resource base has to connect with other partners resource bases in those local areas so so again you're looking at that for, through an organizational specific lens you know, have we got the resource that we need to deliver the change that we think is it needs to be delivered? But you're also looking at, well, how how do we contribute to the kind of place based uh, economic development, that kind of local economic development and, and that and that local value for money picture uh, that all the stakeholders will have to be reporting against? 
Thank you. Uh, and, and Charlotte, final question before we move on to Zoe. I keep saying Zoe, but then ne never let her speak. That's rude. Um, so, so Graham talks a lot about that. You know, you can create, there's, there's a value associated with somebody being retrained or somebody not ending up in a life of crime or, or somebody having a higher skilled job or, or the list goes on. The community benefits are great. But can you value that in one location versus another? So what happens in, you know, Liverpool or Manchester versus what happens in, you know, Cornwall or, um, or the Gambia. Um, is, is that easy to do or is place quite a dominant impact on the value? This is a huge impact on the value. Uh, there are some controversial studies where they value the value of a life uh, with financial terms. And that obviously does not give the same number in a place where money is worth more or less. So globally, that becomes quite a quite a toxic one but but of course we it would be different and a lot of the tools that are out there would recognize that as well a deprivation in index is just looking at the uk uh if i'm providing a job in blackpool which is kind of more deprived than for example westminster uh for those who knows uh, <laughs> uh the uk one one is in the north uh industrial uh used to have more activity than it does now and the other one is basically central london uh if i create a job in, in Blackpool, that's going to have a bigger impact and create more value uh, for that individual and for the society there as well and the community than it would have was Westminster. And of course, we need to recognize that. We also need to be realistic about what information we can collate. Uh, so not every time we will be able to go and calculate that value for that job in exactly that location. I get that. Uh, but we can find studies that have done something similar and we can find information through having those conversations with the people in, in the places that we are creating those jobs. Great. We're, we're all on a journey. So we're going to plug some of these gaps as we go and we're going to learn and develop those those metrics and, and baselines. Thank you. Right, Zoe, there we go. I've introduced you about a dozen times. <laughs> Zoe has been traveling recently, haven't you? You're out you're out at AFCON checking out the um, the African footballers of the current current crop. How how was uh, how was that? That's right. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Yeah, so I was in Cameroon uh, for the last couple of weeks, and um, it was it was an accidental uh, timing with the Afcon football championships across Africa, um, it, which is in Cameroon. So yeah, great atmosphere. Not easy to find a, a hotel with a hot shower. So swings and roundabouts. Yeah. <laughs> so you're going to tell us a little bit about some of the waste aid projects and what's been going sure. on and how social value is working through projects in other locations. Thank you. Yes, I'll do my best in just five minutes. It'll be a bit of a whistle stop tour. Um, so I'm gonna share my slides now. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with Waste Aid, uh, my name is Zoe Lenkovich. I'm Senior Technical Advisor and Head of Communications. Waste Aid, um, we set Waste Aid up about uh, six years ago now in recognition that a lot of uh, investment and expertise goes on waste management in wealthy countries. But if you look at the global picture, one in three people has never had a waste collection service. Um, if you live somewhere like that, then your only options are either to just dump your waste in, the, in your local environment or to set it on fire, and as I'm sure uh, doesn't need explanation, none of those options are ideal. So um, here we are, we share waste management skills with communities, um, governments, other kinds of stakeholders in lower and middle income countries. Um, our vision being a world in which waste isn't causing harm to anybody and um, people in poverty are empowered to recover its value, um, thereby pulling through that social value from overcoming certain environmental challenges. Um, so waste management as a, as a development tool um, is great. I mean, I, I do have a slide that I've cut out of this uh, for timing, but, you know, I think waste management really helps deliver many, many of the sustainability, uh, the sustainable development goals. Um, it's particularly useful for sustainable development because it, it has what we call a low barrier to entry. So, you know, most of the people that we're working with um, in lower income countries who are already making some kind of living from waste, um, you know, they don't have a, a certificate or a qualification that's enabled them to do that. They are, you know, collecting materials that they find in the street, let's say, um, and selling those on to, to be able to eat for the day. Um, so because of that, it's, it's, it's a good opportunity for engaging people um, who perhaps struggle to find other kinds of employment. So we do a lot of work with people with disabilities, um, internally displaced people, um, illiterate people, you know, people with very low um, levels of education and lots of unemployed youth of which there are you know, a lot, as you can imagine, um, particularly in Africa. So um, waste management has been found by the United Nations and the International Solid Waste Association to deliver up to a thousand percent return on investment. 
um, through improved health outcomes for local communities, um, a cleaner environment, which not which isn't just um, you know providing economic benefits in terms of keeping fisheries clean and that kind of thing, uh, but also in terms of people's uh, health and well-being, of course, and in providing dignified jobs where often they are there are very few available. So looking at our social impact uh, a bit more closely, what do we do? We provide training and livelihood opportunities for these people in vulnerable and marginalized situations. Um, we support social groups, small businesses and so on to, to set up and provide employment and livelihood opportunities with this, what we call first step waste management. So getting the stuff collected so that people don't have to burn it or dump it. Um, fostering social enterprises, getting people linking together. This is what I was doing a lot of when I was in Cameroon over the last couple of weeks, visiting different stakeholders, whether they're in government or the private sector, or other community groups, and seeing how we can really work together to maximise the social value of improving waste management. Um, and finally, the advocacy piece. So we've been doing a lot of that, um, obviously, uh, with COP re most recently, uh, but that's an ongoing mission to try to... Um, you know, to uh, to raise the profile, I suppose, of waste management as a as a tool for sustainable development. Um, so this is where I was last week. Uh, this is in the coastal city of Douala in Cameroon. Um, this is a riverbed. Most of the riverbeds um, around this city look pretty much like this. They're absolutely full of plastic waste. Um, there's, you know, there's because there's no waste collection services um, here or in the upstream communities, the riverbed is often used as a waste dump. And then when the rains arrive, it kind of pushes it all out to sea. So here we're working with um, a, a, a private business, we're working with government, with the local mayors in the city. Um, we're recruiting um, unemployed young people, training them up. So people have um, agency over what kind of training path they take and what kind of skills they want to develop. And then from there, we're setting up small local called plastic recovery um, systems, let's say. And, and it's all about getting that plastic, getting someone to buy it, setting up a value chain and getting the people who are collecting it as close to the buyer as possible so that we're not losing any of that value on the way through. Um, so some of our, our um, participants, you know, we've got, um, as I said earlier, people with disabilities a lot of the time, um, people who, for, for whatever reason, are finding it difficult to find other kinds of employment. Um, so we offer the, the training, which can improve their income, um, make sure that we are looking after their working conditions and their well-being, making sure people have access to health care, which a lot of the time they lack. Um, and then there's the, the wider community engagement piece so that people are participating in whatever scheme we are setting up, whether it's for food waste collection or plastics or whatever else. And overall, then providing a cleaner, cleaner and healthier community for everyone to live in and benefit from. So, OK, that's it. I think that's five minutes. Um, I'm going to pass back. There's obviously a lot that I could talk about, but I'm um, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks again. Thanks, Zoe. And uh, yeah, if uh, if you're an organisation or even a, a, an individual out there that wants to put some money into a good cause, the website was there. Please help out. Fantastic work going on. And, uh, and the CIWM, Child Institution of Waste Management, just made a very large donation to help support that particular project. There's some really good work going on. But the question that that raises, Zoe, is how long does that charity function have to, have to continue before these things become self-financing, perhaps? Because otherwise, there's this constant requirement, not only for volunteers, yeah. I'm going to come back to Graham on volunteers, because there are a lot of volunteers in his project, but there's also a lot of cash going into some of these projects, aren't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So I think um, I would say, first of all, we don't rely on volunteers at Waste Aid. Um, we get funding to set a project up, but the whole idea of what we're doing is that we're collecting materials and getting them into that value chain. So we're making sure that we can get the best possible price, the best possible value for those materials. And often, ideally, not just the value of the material that's collected, but also getting paid, getting people paid for the service to society that they are providing, which a lot of the time doesn't happen. Um, you know, just from having a, a clean street, you know, we, we pay our taxes and we get street cleaners for that. And um, so it's not really fair that in, you know, in many poorer countries, the people who are keeping the streets clean are only able to recover like the value of the actual, you know, the plastic itself or the food waste, you know, a lot of wastes don't really have um, decent value. Um, if they did, they wouldn't be littered. You know, it's not often I trip over a load of aluminium and go, oh, you know, 
was <laughs> always causing pollution problems down our street. You know, it's not because it's got value. So it's a case of, you know, making sure that people's um, contribution to society is valued as much as the material itself. Really, really positive message. And coming back to Graham, I mean, volunteers, I'm assuming there's a lot of volunteers through some of your projects. I mean, is that sustainable? It depends what you call a volunteer, really. Uh, so if you're active in your local community and you're trying to make things better for you, your family, your neighbours, your wider community, are, are you volunteering or are you just being a responsible citizen? Um, but and the two points I would make there is, is, is if your use of volunteers is limited to free labour to get stuff done, then you won't have many volunteers for very long. Uh, it needs to be an enriching experience. Uh, I'd also make the point that volunteering isn't free. Many commissioners and many business partners of ours assume that, well, we'll just get lots of volunteers to, to do this kind of stuff because it's it's free. Volunteering isn't free. Um, someone needs to coordinate that volunteering, to manage volunteers, to deploy them safely, to provide the kit, to provide the training, to provide the supervision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so and that all has a resource attached to it. So, so it, 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 it is sustainable because people do want to make their communities better and they are prepared to give their time to do that. Uh, and if you as an organization, and this is one of the roles that we play, can, can kind of sit behind that and provide some professional infrastructure to make that work better, to deepen the impact, to, to widen the scope of what those volunteers are able to achieve. Um, so there's hundreds of thousands of um, small community groups operating voluntarily in communities right across the UK. What, what they lack sometimes is a bit of infrastructure, something that can connect them and their work into the strategy of the local council or the priorities of the business that happens to have a, you know, a large facility on their doorstep. It's that kind of infrastructure support that's really critical. It is seldom seen and people find it difficult to fundraise for or to, uh, or to generate income for. Uh, it's the kind of glue that makes these things work. Um, so glue can be really powerful, but it can also be invisible. Um, and it's probably at its best when it's invisible. But that still means someone needs to spot it's there and, and resource it. You stole my thunder. I was going to use the glue analogy. All I'm going to say about glue is it can make some of the recycling really hard to recycle. But that's another story. Um, Zoe, there's a question here about tackling climate. Uh, sorry, mm -hmm. tackling cultural behavioural change. I mean, is that a focal point of some of your work? I mean, I think the skill stuff and the and some some of the end market activity I, I get. But are you working with with the communities that can kind of change their perception of waste and what they should do with it? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, good question. Thank you. So I kind of think um, you need to do both. You need to do the two activities at the same time, the, the community, um, you know, the communications and what we call the sensitization. So that behavior change piece has to go hand in hand with providing a service, because if you say to people, dumping and burning your waste is bad for your health, it's bad for the environment, and then walk away, you know, not leaving them with any, any alternative other than to dump or burn their waste, then actually you might be doing harm to people's mental well-being and whilst not providing any solutions. So we tend to try and do both hand in hand. Um, yeah, changing people's behaviour, getting people to use a bin, you know, in, in many places, you know, you only have bins if you have people to come and empty those bins. Um, so just that simple behavior change of getting people to put their waste into a container um, re can sometimes require, you know, ongoing repeated um, behavior change. But um, we tend to work with with local partners, artist groups and so on, um, who will create songs that can go on the radio or do, you know, some kind of performing arts or mural painting, that kind of thing to really, you know, so that it's coming from the grassroots, from that community. So it's not us delivering a message. It's they are developing that message for themselves. So, so, I mean, that's brilliant. And I, I love that because that, that's exactly like Graham, you know, and, and I'm sure Sarah will say something similar as well. I mean, it, it's the community helping inspire and, and drive yeah. the community. But did the community come up with the idea in the first place and come knocking on your door saying, help, we need it? Or, or are you looking for projects where there's great community activity already that you could become the glue? Sure. Do you know what? We get approached by hundreds of communities um, every month, I would say, saying, look, we've got so much waste here. What can we do with it? So finding communities that want help is never a challenge. Um, so, you know, quite often, though, those communities don't know they don't have um, the awareness of how of what value is in the different materials sure. and how to set up a system to collect it and that kind of thing. So that's where our knowledge comes in. Thank you. Right. Let's, let's, let's park camera in for a moment, even though it was a good tournament. Um, let's move on to our last speaker, and then I'm going to get all of you involved again, so don't worry. It's, uh, it's Miss Sarah Ottaway. 
Um, Sarah, how are you? You've just had a week off. Are you ready for this? I am. I'm ready and I've been <clears throat> practicing what I preach during my week off as well. So uh, I've uh, ready and raring to go. I, don't I, I, I hear you, you're, you're doing some, some uh, home renovations and, and all of your old kitchens up for uh, reuse. Is that right? It was, yeah, yeah. So over the past week, we've uh, pulled out the kitchen and I think just over 90% of it has gone out and been reused uh, within uh, an hour's drive of, of where we are. So, uh, yeah, it's all being uh, put to a new lease of life. Very impressive. And, and again, you're setting the, the bar very high for your boss to live up to. So thanks very much for that. You're very welcome. I will remind you when you next do some home improvement. <sighs> Sarah, the floor is yours. What's, um, <laughs> before you start, though, I, I'm, I'm interested, A, in how we interface with say the world of Graham, for example, you know, is that a natural transition from the community led charitable activity to the space that we operate in as a profitable business and, and of, you know, where do volunteers fit into our space and, and how do you industrialize some of these things? They're the questions that are going to, going to get fired at you after this five minutes. So thinking cap on. No worries. It's, it's firmly on. Don't worry. And I think that some of that will come through what I'm covering and I'm sure more of it will come through in the debate afterwards as well. However, to come after those three speakers is quite daunting because uh, what an incredible three set of speakers they are. So let's hope I can uh, I can provide an equal bit of a useful uh, insight to, to be part of today's webinar. So in case you haven't come across Suez and who we are, uh, just a quick reminder, we are one of the biggest uh, resource and waste management companies here in the UK. We handle about 11 million tonnes of resources every year from both the public and private sector. We save more carbon than we emit. And we currently have over 300 sustainability champions working across uh, the UK on uh, environmental and social projects in their local communities and on their sites. Uh, we've been discussing social value since it came into law here in the UK in 2013. Uh, and it's obviously a big focus on my role and what I do, hence why it's in my job title. Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to cover in, in the next couple of minutes is kind of a, is more about the why and what it means for us as a sector and the things that we've been learning through the kind of the three years or so that we've really focused uh, and uh, understanding what social value means to us uh, and the rest of uh, our peers in the industry. So I think, I think it's important just to step back and remember that when it comes to the environment, it's probably less so for those of us on this call, but for many, there's a real disconnect uh, that's, that's established between humans and the natural world. You know, we can see that through you know, the images that Zoe put on our screen to, you know, the, the uh, masses of the green space that get knocked down in the UK for us to build uh, houses on. Uh, but we've forgotten that, you know, until very recently that pollination is an essential part of our food system, that trees and plants provide us with oxygen every day and the water we drink doesn't magically appear out of a tap. Um, and, uh, and there's a really important role that social value can play in bringing that connection back together. And I'll show you a bit about what we've done. So we've been on a real journey over the last three years. And I think the, the one of the key things that underpins everything that's come from that journey is, is going back to what Charlotte said in at the beginning of her, her slide, which is about the purpose of social value and what it's there to do. And I think ultimately, and the way I've always described it, it's about understanding and informing decision making uh, and the action that comes from that, that brings the biggest benefits to people, communities and society as a whole. And next slide, please, Bertha. Uh, and it's it's that purpose, along with the principles that we we apply using the, the Social Value UK principles that we, we bring into what we do here at Suez. It's a really ideal way to reconnect the, that strategic thinking and decision making all the way from senior C-suite level down to um, ground floor day to day level by uh, by individuals. It brings that decision making and reconnects the environmental uh, the environment and the benefits that it brings to society and people alongside uh, those social and economic benefits alongside it. And that's one of the reasons why, uh, Suez, we've used this definition. So what you can see on this slide is how we talk about social value and those three areas of impact. And do you know what the best thing is? Everyone gets it. The conversations I have, whether it's with our, our regional directors, a contract director, a member of staff out on site or in a crew, our customers, our suppliers, they understand this principle. When you talk about it in this way, it makes sense. It's easy for them to relate to about what we're doing, the part that they play in this, and what more we can do as a result. And that's why, you know, we've got these 300 champions, as an example, who are just delivering some amazing things on site because we're enabling them to take that action and have those uh, and think about it in this way. And what that also does, it helps us combine the, the three strands. You know, when you look at it from a strategic point of view, when you look at the resources and waste sector, it brings the three strands of what we're trying to do together into one. It, we're protecting the environment. We're benefiting people and communities by doing that. And in doing so, we're doing it in a cost effective and a financially sustainable way that benefits local economies and, again, people in that process. 
And as you start peeling back those layers and dig into the benefits of what they're bringing, they are vast and completely interconnected, as we've already talked about quite extensively. And they're only set to grow as we build towards a more circular economy. Next slide, please, Becca. Take employment. Uh, it's widely reported that recycling creates more jobs than disposal has ever done. And that's going to evolve as we move into things like reuse and repair, where skills and technical knowledge and the replicate application is going to need more skills, more hands on um, uh, management of those things at the same time. We'll see some of these great examples that Graham's talked about through what groundwork have been doing. And they bring huge environmental benefits with them as we move waste higher up the waste hierarchy. And we've been digging into this in a bit more detail as part of the work that, that I've been doing. And on the screen, you see the example of reuse. And some of the examples, when you place them into those three areas, are, are quite obvious. You know, we're moving waste up the hierarchy, great. Um, perhaps some of them are less so. So the, uh, the links that it builds with the local community, because you're working with individuals who come in, you're working with local businesses, local organisations who get involved in what you're doing in these spaces. You have employment, you have training opportunities. And um, we've taken what we've done on reuse because we've been doing reuse for like over a decade now we now have a reuse hub in manchester which you haven't heard of before it's a, it's a facility that we have developed and run on behalf of the greater manchester combined authority it's a six thousand square foot warehouse it's a multifunctional space we're doing everything from showcase, showcasing the fantastic items that people often throw away all the way through to supporting bike and electrical uh, electrical repair at the same time and that's going to expand and evolve over time but the benefits go far beyond this. And that's because we're working with organizations in and across Manchester that create even more opportunities than what we can do individually uh, in our part of what we've been doing leading up to that point. So whether that's um, electrical repair that's with Recycling Lives, who work with the prison service to help people come out of prison and build new lives for themselves, to the Manchester Bike Kitchen that are teaching kids how to repair bikes. So we're you're bringing bikes back into reuse and teaching them valuable skills that give them something to focus on rather than getting into trouble uh, which is often the reason they end up there uh, and also giving skills that they can take away with but also going back to the question that we had before there's a financial return that comes with this too so we've we've built a model that will allow it uh, allow us to cover the cost of operation um, but also we have committed to through the contract with the greater Manchester Combined Authority to donate over £300,000 that we are confident will come through the revenue of reuse, uh, through reuse in Manchester, that will go to the mayor's charity and through an environment fund. And anything that we don't achieve, uh, so has topped up itself, because we're so confident in the ability of reuse to deliver not just benefits directly for people and for the environment, but also financially so it can stand on its own two feet. And that's really important when we're looking at delivering more social value in a sustainable way as well. So in answer to the question, uh, how environmental is social value? I'd say that it's uh, to build on Charlotte's yes, I'd say it's very. Uh, and the more we understand and the better decisions we can make and the bigger impact we can have for people and for planet. Thank you, Adam. Thanks very much, Sarah. Again, passion is never in question with this panel, is it? Great question coming from the audience here, Sarah. So let's deal with this one first. Um, so everybody in the organisation buys into this, they get it. Is that because they work in waste and resources or is that because the return on investment is so obvious? Or is it something else? Do you know, I think it's a bit of both. I think it's a bit of both. I think being in the sector, you 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 get that obviously we're interlinked with the environment to a degree. Um, but also when you start talking about return on investment, you start talking about these wider benefits, you start having the conversation, you start peeling that onion of understanding those greater benefits. Uh, and, and actually the benefits that be generated that aren't obvious at first glance, you start understanding the deeper detail and then you can see that return on investment so much more so even if you aren't putting a pounds figure on it you can see the bigger bigger benefits that it's generating and that's a really powerful conversation thank you and wh volunteers where do they fit into the these projects and programs that we've got operating across the uk i think volunteers is a really interesting one i think graham i come back to graham's point on that is that is how and who uh, and where they fall into that process i think if you're just looking at someone giving up their you know uh, giving up their time on a, an informal basis that's very different to someone coming through um, a, a program such as you know some of the work that we're doing with organizations like recycling lives um, and, and others across across the country so volunteering is important but it, it all has a lot of value because it brings benefits for the volunteer as well as the organization but it needs to be done in the right way and used in the right place as well so it brings the right benefits not just as graham said it's used or seen as a, a way to get free labor because it's definitely not that and that's definitely not an approach we take 
I, I, I like that cool message from everybody. It's not free labor. And, and just, are, are we the same glue as Graham, a different glue or are, are we, are we glues that can sit alongside each other? I think, I think we are glues that sit alongside each other and also interface in, in the same places as well. You know, so we work with, for example, every furnish who are a, a fantastic organization who actually do something similar to what Graham was talking about in, uh, in Teesside. They actually run our both bulky waste collection services and that feeds into their whole reuse operation. So I think there's great ways, that, it's a great example of the ways that we can work together. Uh, so even though we might appear to be a, you know, a big scary corporate, that doesn't mean that A, we are, uh, and B, it doesn't mean you can't work alongside each other to benefit both organizations. And, and, and Graham, coming back from the other side, how does the charity world view big corporates? <laughs> I think that's too generic a question uh, to, to respond with a generic answer. Uh, I, I, th I think where I'd probably take that conversation is um, that, uh, that as, as you say, Sarah, there's a lot of these examples around of innovative practice in terms of reuse or refurb or, you know, and that and some of that connects into the industry and some of it doesn't connect into the industry. Uh, I think if there's a challenge I have, and I'm constantly thinking about this, is it's how does that stuff that's kind of seen as the nice to have at the moment, the interesting, innovative little offshoot, how does that actually become core business in this sector? Yeah. Uh, because if we're going to make this shift, then somehow that table has got to turn, hasn't it? You know, the way the way the sector used to operate has got to change and shift and it's got to look more like this interesting collection of diverse locally specific sometimes charitably funded enterprises that needs to be the mainstream waste industry somehow so so you know my, my challenge will be back to you how do you as a business shift your model so that actually you're delivering much more in that way than you have been in the way that you were delivering 10 or 20 years ago it's a, it's a very good challenge and i'm sure she'd answer it but i'm going to hold her because she can answer it when she wraps up at the end um quick question about hwrc so staff down the tip staff at the recycling center you, zoe you're seeing these people operating you know overseas as well how engaged are they with reuse and this transition generally so let's start with zoe then then graham and then, then sarah quickly are, are they on board do they dislike it is is it, is it difficult to, to to explain sure okay i haven't worked i haven't seen an hwrc in a lower income country i'll be honest with you it's normally dump sites and people recovering materials from the dump sites so they are engaged with it because they are there to recover the value if this, if they can't see how to recover value from something then it will stay at the dump site that's it graham you've got you've got some of these projects haven't you yeah yeah and i've seen some really really engaged employees um but like everybody in the wider population it will vary some people turn up and want to do their job and go home uh, some people absolutely live and breathe the cause that they that they feel they're connected with so so i th i think the 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 job there is to find those champions uh, as you are doing in Suez and enable those champions to kind of influence and impact on the behavior of the wider workforce thank you and sarah we've got some antiques roadshow experts working on our sites haven't we <laughs> We do. We have some fantastic specialists on our site when it comes to reuse. Um, but I think also coming back to the question, I think absolutely key is to help individuals understand what they're doing and why. I think, you know, if you just turn up and go, guys and girls, can you just stick that stuff in there? Stick it in a container or stick it in that shop. People don't understand. You want to understand why you're doing something. And actually, that's that's something that we've done everywhere we've introduced um, reuse is having those conversations with site staff nice and early. So they also can be part of the process because often they'll think of perhaps different ways of approaching, um, you know, intercepting reusable items or different points we can talk to people to actually inform the process as well. So that's, that's really key. Cool. Right. Let's shift the, uh, the focus a little bit. Good question here. Thank you, Ian, for this one. Uh, have we got any examples of delivering social value with an environmental theme, I, I, I would add, uh, in partnership with further education or higher education colleges? Charlotte, any examples that spring to mind where colleges are at the heart rather than a, a geographical community, perhaps? You're on mute, but. I really that, sorry. Um... Uh, we've got a few colleges uh, and universities I remember so very. So how they would work with social value is that they will quite often link up with charities. So I don't know if that's where they mean from, from that partnership. Okay, cool, cool. So I'm just misunderstanding the question. But what they do is to link up with those charities and work with those, uh, but also understanding what do their stakeholder need and want. 
So that might actually be consulting the students are there, the teachers, the community. So understanding their context uh, to know where to focus their efforts. And one of the charities that we do work with that has linked uh, environmental aspirations around environmental programs is tree for, Trees for Cities. So they basically plant a lot of trees, uh, tackling climate change through that, but they also do educational collaborations uh, with other partners. And the use of social value methodology and a management system to, to really account for those changes that they're creating, both to people and the planet. Fabulous. And Graham, have you got, got any projects past or present with higher education, further education? Yeah, quite a few. Uh, and and I, I think there's quite a big conversation to be had about older teenagers uh, in, in this space. I mean, it's often said fairly glibly that, 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 that the generation of teenagers we've got at the moment are the most environmentally switched on uh that, that there's ever been and and you know it, and it's not an issue you know getting children young people of that age engaged in environmental activities but that clearly is another glib generalization um you know there are many teenagers who absolutely are switched on and, and, and many that you know just have other concerns other pressing issues you know slightly more difficult backgrounds whatever it is that's crowding crowding out and we, and we did some interesting research last year that talked to young people about where they were getting their environmental education and the most depressing finding of that is that uh, none of them said school. Um, so top of the list was David Attenborough. Second on the list was YouTube. Um, that's where environmental education is coming from for a generation. So that's, you know, there's a whole conversation to be had about what goes on in school and how people are leaving school with the basics. Uh, but there's always a way into that conversation. So, so, so one of the, you know, one of the projects I remember is, um, you know, if, if a group of teenagers say they're not interested in the environment, they are interested in fashion once you get talking about fashion you're quickly into fast fashion you're quickly into a conversation about the global environment uh, and sustainable development so there's always a way into those conversations i think so it sounds like you should be in sales graham the way that you quickly turned a a, a barrier into an opportunity I'm, I'm with you entirely on that sarah we we work with colleges and uh and universities and other institutions because they are hubs of innovation and opportunity. And sometimes it's just about finding projects that really give them that, that opportunity to, to get stuck into, isn't it? Oh, gosh, yeah. We, we had a, I lost count of how many projects we got involved in last year. But I think the, the big one, the big example for us has been, uh, been the Reuse Hub. A lot of the designers at the hub actually came from a number of projects we had with three or four of the universities across Manchester that we, we got involved at different points. So there was the design of the hub. There was some of the um, artistic design and some of the backgrounds. Uh, which are beautiful again designed by students and we actually have um, a, a member of staff who was actually a, a graduate student who came in to design some of the um, the uh, set pieces that we have so kind of the displays of items that have come through the household waste recycling centers uh, and demonstrating the value and the beauty of these pieces so she's actually upcycled and used all her like skills and things like upholstery and repair uh, and, uh, and now on display. And uh, she's now a permanent member of staff because she, A, is so talented, and B, we, we see there's so much opportunity to bring her into the business. And I've got a funny feeling she's going to be traveling the country. I think all the other reuse shops are a bit jealous, and they're going to be getting her involved too. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's so much that comes out of those experiences, both directly and, and long-term as well. Uh, and, and, and a quick shout-out to Ian Poyser, who posed the question. Ian, if you want to get involved with, with us or any of the panellists, we'll, uh, we'll hook you up afterwards, mate. No problem. Listen, the chat's been brilliant. I'm, I'm watching the chat. I'm watching the Q&A coming in. Um, there's a big shout-out to Kingston University, doing some great work on circular economy and reuse. Well done. That's my alma mater, by the way. So a big shout-out to Kingston. Thank you, Perva, for that. Um, still more questions coming in, but I'm conscious of time. Um, so let, let's ask you all, and we'll start with, with you, Charlotte. I, I think we're all accepting that social value and environmental go hand in hand. There's, there is no yes or no to this. It's just, of course, Adam, you're right. But I'm interested in, are there some real barriers to making social value the norm, you know, in terms of decision making? We've talked about data. We've talked about metrics. We've talked about narrative. We've talked about community. We've talked about place. But it's not the norm at the moment, is it? Not everybody goes, oh, this is, this is the right decision because social value says so. What's, what have we got to do in the next couple of years to make this more common in terms of decision making? Charlotte. Uh, I, I fully agree with what you're saying, that we're all accepting that social value environment do go hand in hand. We get that on this call. That doesn't mean, or this meeting, that doesn't mean that everyone else does. So around the world, we quite often find situations where there might be uh, competing agendas. So there's, for example, 
great stuff going on in terms of net zero. There's also companies buying loads areas of uh, land to plant trees, uh, but displacing the people that live there. So there's policy situation that is decision-making from, from organizations or companies that is having an effect on someone else. So we need to get a lot better on understanding that we're linked together and not just the people that we got here today, but actually spreading that message to more people uh, to really, really understand the change that we're creating for the people and bring that into our decision making. And it's a big one and it's a cultural change one. Fabulous. And we're at the forefront of that debate today. So thank you. Graham, what's, what, what about you? What, what, what have we got to overcome in the next couple of years? I'll, I'll focus on the kind of commercial side of this in a way, because, in, you know, the UK social value has been driven actually by government. Uh, you know, government has legislated it into existence uh, in terms of incorporating social value metrics into the spend of, of the public pound um, and has, has done a really good job of making sure that public authorities in particular build it into procurement. Uh, processes. So whenever you're bidding for a tender, uh, then you have to demonstrate how you're going to deliver social value. And that's really driven innovation in the industry and in many industries, I think across many sectors. Where I see the problem arising is that uh, when it hands over from procurement to contract management, that commitment weakens. And when those contracts are re-let or renegotiated year on year and someone wants a 10% saving, I know which 10% will disappear first. It will be the social value promise. Uh, so I think until social value goes from being a procurement um, uh, hurdle that people just have to get over into being uh, absolutely driven in and embedded in the contract management framework, uh, then I still think it will be uh, a nice to have, not an essential. Strong messaging. Thank you. Couldn't disagree with any of that. Spot on, mate. Uh, Zari. Where, what, what about for you from an international, you know, particularly, you know, maybe an African perspective? Sure. Yeah, thanks. So I was saying, I mean, for, for all of our projects to to, to happen, um, we rely on the generosity of donors and partners, um, including, you know, the local councils where we're working, but also international companies. Um, and I would say something that I really noticed. So when we when we founded Waste Aid and we were, you know, very much pushing the, the social value of our activities, and then there was Blue Planet too, and all that people cared about was stopping plastic getting in the oceans. That was that was it. So we kind of pivoted our comms a little bit. So like, yeah, we do that too. Uh, but we get a pretty, you know, there's a lot of um uh, potential donors and um, funding systems, let's say, that have been set up that are really purely focused on the material value of what you can collect. Um, and it takes time to, to, to build in the social value to these projects. And that's what really makes them sustainable, you know, getting the buy in from the councils, from the community elders, from the people that are going to be participating in your programs. Um, so it would be, I think for me, um, it would be for the discussion to mature a bit and for people to recognize that, yeah, stopping, for example, marine plastic pollution is, is, is a really critical thing for us to do, but we need to do that in a very mindful way. And that takes a bit more time and a bit more investment to make sure that it can continue good messaging uh, systems thinking again which actually is, is is common to all of you and, yeah. and sarah um on the same question yep so i'm going to be cheeky and do two things but very quickly because i know of time one is about consistency of approach i think underpins everything that charlotte graham and zoe have just said um having obviously we can't create pure consistency because there's not one value for the same the same thing necessarily but creating a better consistency of approach to help us all come to this looking at it from the same a similar hymn sheet would be really valuable one way in the uk we can achieve that which is the second thing which is either around expanding the uh, the developments to the social value act that happened a, lot, uh, a year or two ago which is taking it from just a central government uh, legal requirement to a public procurement requirement because that then shifts that narrative across the entire public spend not just central government spend which will be a big game changer for supply chains thank you uh now i'm going to give you each one word or one statement at best what's your takeaway message charlotte what do you want the audience to go and do next or think next no pressure wow um understand who your stakeholders are and how you're affecting them bring cool. that into your decision making Okay, Zoe, I'm changing the order now. Fine, thank you. I would say to think longer term and really, you know, from a systems perspective, as you were saying, um, you know, if we want to develop, we've only, you know, people have the awareness about the problems that poorly managed waste generate. 
has really developed recently and we need to think longer term and more maturely about what we do about that. Stakeholders, longer term thinking, Graham. Uh, if you want to do something that connects social and environmental value together, start from the point of understanding how much inequality there is across both of us. And you brought us back to levelling up. Brilliant. Sarah. Uh, I'm going to give you a hashtag, Adam. Peel the onion. Find out yep. all the different <laughs> different benefits that are going on. And uh, that's how you can understand, like Graham says, where the, where the inequalities are and where you can really make a difference. Thank you very much. So much insight. So much, so many good questions still to come. I mean, it's brilliant. We could have been here for another hour, but we can't. But um, we will pass the questions on from the audience to you, the panelists, and hopefully we can start some new relationships, which will be positive for all. Um, and even some good feedback saying, well done, everybody. So thank you very much, audience. Great final point, though. Somebody wrote in and said, making sure that, you know, we look after those that work in our sector and making sure that, you know, the social benefits aren't just for the communities we work with, but also for the staff. So, you know, mental well, wellness, uh, healthcare, et cetera. So well done. Thanks for that shout out. So um, Sweater, I think we're done, but I've got to say that was a great session. Thoroughly enjoyed it. There's so much more progress to be made on, on, on social value and, and its alignment with the environment, but it's all about the triple bottom line because if you can't get the fundamentals of the economics right, some of this good work just won't happen. So back to you, Sweater. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks a lot to all the panelists. Uh, just a quick update to the attendees. You will have access to the webinar via Zoom and the webinar is going to go up on our website in two weeks. And do sign up to our newsletter to be intimated about future webinars. Bye-bye. <laughs> have a good day, good afternoon, good evening.